All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. Welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity. Normally, I would be introducing that dashingly handsome mustache uh, aficionado, Don the Predator Fryer, but due to some un, un uh, uh, due to circumstances, he will not be able to join us today. Uh, so, in uh, in his place, we have Tony Martinez, and he's got facial hair, so he 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 fits the bill. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see. Tony's normally behind the camera, but uh, he's coming out of it in it, some seclusion and to sit in and make sure that the show indeed goes on. And like I said before, he's got that mustache and facial hair, so he is good to go. Today's <laughs> guest is none other than Diamond Dallas Page, other known as DDP, a legendary figure in the world of professional wrestling. With a career in both WCW and WWE that spans decades from his early days as a manager to his transformation into an accomplished in ring performer, champion, and eventually the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame. DDP's journey through the square circle is a story of perseverance, reinvention, and championship success. Beyond wrestling, he is also a fitness instructor, author, and motivational speaker, inspiring countless individuals to embrace a healthier lifestyle through his DDPY program. It's an honor and privilege to have legendary Diamond Dallas Page with us today. With that all said there, Diamond, I, I've, I've been, I've met you uh, on different occasions on different shows. Um, I'm not certain if it was for WCW at the time or, or for, for, for Vince, but I have met you. When, remember we went to the ICP, the Insane Clown Bosses show? Oh my God. <laughs> That was like culture shock. I love those guys. When when they did the gathering, and we and me and you, me and you were sitting in the back and going, "What?" It was like watching. I was in a movie called Devil's Rejects, and it was kind of like that. Driving back there, in, in the I mean, you could hear music all around and comedians. I mean, it's a really big deal. Those guys. I tell you what, I give a lot. I give a lot of credit to those cats from insane, the insane clown posse and. And they were big wrestling fans and wrestlers themselves. They wrestled in WCW. But I remember me and you, Scott Hall was with us. I believe Big Sid was with us too. And as we're driving back there, I was like, man, this feels like Devil's Reject as we're driving back. Here. Because it's out in the middle of nowhere. I yeah. mean, I just, I mean, I remember, I remember driving down, it was like a two-lane road, and there's cops. There's cops. They got they got the road shut right down, and literally they're inspecting every vehicle that goes beyond a certain point. And then literally they're stopping. I'm watching. It, there's quite a lineup. I'm watching all these vehicles get stopped. I mean, and, and, and literally people are being asked to get out of their vehicles. Trunks are being popped up, stuff like that. I pull up there, and the guy just simply looks at me and just looks at me, just and just waves me on. I'm thinking there was no questions asked. He just looked at me, and, and that was it. I'm thinking, well, oh, I don't understand. And then. Uh, I remember pulling up to the gate. As I pull up to the gate, they have they have one of their their people there with the clipboard stuff like that. And again, he looks like he's three sheets to the wind. And uh, and he he looks at me. He goes, he goes, you sure you're supposed to be here? <laughs> and I go, well, yeah. Exactly. There's a professional. There's a, uh, a talking thing that's taken at such a time. This that he said he, he pulls the shades out, looks at me, look, and they're like, okay. And it was. Yeah, it looked like remind me of like of a zombie apocalypse type mountain, but, but, but movie. Mean, it was it was wild, and then you go to the dirt roads, and there's all these different dirt roads taking you to different things. And hey, I just I remember I wasn't wrestling that night; I was just doing a run in a diamond cutter, so I was in and out, and didn't get what? hit with things. Yeah, well, that, that's one of those Phil things, especially because I, I, I've been there on two different occasions. And the first time, it was like, and I think it was, it was probably the first time because I was just like in shock and awe because, well, first off, the show starts when, what, four o'clock in the morning? It was crazy, yeah. I just know that it was like, it was well after midnight and the show starts at this be, bewitching hour. And all I know is that it doesn't match, about, it doesn't matter what the match is going to be about. You're gonna get bombarded with Fago two liter bottles of pop. They're gonna be they're gonna be like shook up, thrown in like hand grenades. They're gonna hit this blast off here. So literally, you're wrestling, you're slipping on this. You got sticky pop all over you, but then you got people there throwing other stuff at you. And they could, 
you could lose an eye or something like that out there at, at that. Yeah, that, that's why I was happy to run in. Diamond Cutter got a good pop and got the hell out of her. Didn't get hit with anything. And it was wild, though, man. But I, I love those guys. And really, you talk about businessmen. I mean, they found a niche that that they ran with and had, like, number one best-selling album a couple of different times. They really, they, they really played to their audience, and that was their deal. I think we started at 2 in the morning, I want to say it was. But whatever it was, we were there till the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> so we went back and hopped on our plane and flew home. But uh, wow. that, that was one of the first, I believe that's one of the first time me and you got to really know each other and hang and talk. And, you know, like we were like two like really normal guys. There. <laughs> well, did nope. you be, uh, okay, now, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt you, but if I just could just talk about uh, younger in your career, what other types of sports did you play like in high school or college? Did you go to college? Um, actually, uh, I was reading like on a third grade level at the age of 30. I was lucky I got through high school. Um, I was when I was a kid, I was, uh, a, you know, I loved football. That was like my passion. Uh -huh. And when I was in sixth grade, I was starting with the eighth graders and seventh grade. And I couldn't wait till the night. You know, I was 12 years old and I walked out in front of a car and it hit me and I flew 42 feet from point of impact. And back then, this is 1966. I'm 67 now. So this was, you know, uh, 68. Uh, 1968, and there was no such thing as rehab or anything, and they wouldn't let me play football, which crushed me. So they let me play basketball or baseball, and it was really the best thing that happened to me because with basketball, which is what I picked, you can get better all by yourself. Like, you don't have to be picked on the team. You can shoot layups and hooks and foul shots, and, and you can literally, if, if you have a strong work ethic, which I do, uh, you can get better. In the beginning, I sucked, but got a little bit better, got a little bit better, and then I became one of the better players, you know, in the state of New Jersey. And for me, when I look back at that, it taught me that work ethic equals results because I kept seeing that. And again, no one really knew what ADD or dyslexia was when we were kids, you know? So, you know, I just literally, I tell you what I did learn. I learned about bartering. I learned about, uh, uh, what do they call it? A quid pro quo. I learned about that. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. And I figured out a way to get through school. And I actually, I, I didn't get any real scholarships to play basketball, even though I had plenty of people talking to me. And then they saw my grades, which were just enough to, and a lot of the teachers just passed me along because I was like king of the cheat sheets. And, you know, I could, I could pass because I really paid attention in class, but reading and writing was not my thing. And it took me really till I was 31 before I started to focus in on learning how to read. And got a little bit better, a little bit better. And when I was living out in Los Angeles, when I was 47, a buddy of mine, we got in a surfing accident, like we just jammed up and we ended up becoming really good friends out of it. And it turned out that he was dyslexic and he turned me on to this school that was there called the Eris Learning Center. And it was for kids and adults with learning disabilities. So I went to see his teacher who at the time, Dan, was 85 years old. Her name oh. was Rose, and she was the one teaching me. And I would go, because I'd still go and do things on the weekends, travel or whatever, but I'd come back. So every Tuesday and every Thursday, I would go and learn from her. And a lot of it was like really training your brain, how to turn things on. Like it was real. I couldn't really explain it. All I know is, I kept getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And today, you know, I'm probably reading it about, you know, seventh or eighth grade level, which is pretty good for the norm because the norm is sixth grade, you know, but, you know, I'm a pretty good writer now. And I've still got the dyslexia because it takes me a while to write stuff. But now it just, you know, as time, because I always use my brain, man, for everything. I'm always trying to do whatever I can to, from oxygen on the brain to, to everything to, to try to keep my brain sharp and okay. if, especially after the shit we've been through you know well do you i mean do you do like an, an oxygen uh do you have like a um what is yes. oxygen uh bed dead beds that you can climb into like a little uh cylinder type of deal 
Yes, I have one that's PSI 12, which means 12 pounds per square inch, which is like being 30 feet below sea level. And I have another one that is 15 PSI, which is like being 45 feet below sea level. And I'll go in there and read. I'll go in there and write stuff. Uh, the new thing I've been doing, though, that I, I spend most of my time doing this, like every single morning I'm up, I'm in the cold plunge because I was a big ice guy when nobody iced their body. I was icing my body from day one. And uh, the cold plunge, I get in 39 degree water every single morning I'm home for five to seven minutes. Then I get on a thing that's called Live O2. And what this is, it's hypoxia training. So it's the low, the, the easiest level is 10,000 feet. And you've got this mask on and it's got a bag of air, uh, oxygen, that the of the eight foot bag, the top six feet is filled with 90% oxygen and the bottom two feet, which is three feet wide as well, is filled with this, that oxygen level of, 10,000 feet to 22,000 feet. And here's why I've been really focused on this. My memory has gotten so much better. And here's what, what it does. I, I now train at 22,000 feet and probably took about a month to get there. And what I'll do is when you're at 22,000 feet, that's 8% oxygen. Like right now, we're breathing in 21% oxygen. Okay. And if people go up, but like they lose their breath. Like I'm now, I'm now conditioned for it. My wife is a is a mountain climber. Like she's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Fuji. She's probably done about 30, 14, you know, 14,000. They call them the 14ers, I guess. Uh, but we'll go to Colorado once a year just so she she climbed four of them the last time we were there. Um, but, and it was easier for her because she does the same thing on a treadmill. I do it on a bike. And what I will do is I will go from 10 to 12 minutes of 8% oxygen. Now, why am I doing that? Because that's like, you know, when, when you get COVID, they put that thing on your finger and you see how much, you know, oxygen's in your blood. I've taken my blood oxygen down to 76 and that's where people, they're like, you're going to die. Like, no, you're not. You're going to be conditioned. Because how do you think they freaking climb Mount Everest? Right, it exactly. Takes, it takes 45 miles just to get the base camp. And that's 17,000 feet. And now they're going to go to 29,000 feet. We got look, do, at, look, at all the, look at all the guides that are taking up all these different people from the different countries. I mean, they, right. have, they have people right from there. And, and are they wearing any of those gadgetry and stuff like that? No, because they're, again, they live there. And that's that's home to them, so they've already been acclimated to those different types of uh, pressures. Exactly. So what I do is I'll do. Let's say I do ten minutes at eight percent oxygen. They have a brain protocol. This guy Mark, who developed this thing, where now you go into sprint and you turn it up a couple of notches. Okay, meaning the not the air, but the uh, the oxygen, but the, you know the pressure of the bike. Maybe it's if you're, if my wife's on a on a treadmill, she'll make it steeper okay. and then she'll start to move faster. So for me on the bike, I just turn it up two notches and then I go into a full blown sprint and you're supposed to do it for 20 seconds, still no oxygen, you know, 8% oxygen. Then I flip the switch and it goes to 90% oxygen and you're still sprinting for another 10 seconds and then you can coast for 30 seconds. What happens here? is that your body is dying for the oxygen. So when you fit that switch and you keep going, it's like a vacuum. And it's so it's going deep into your cellular level, yeah. also going into your brain. And that's why my both of my chambers that I have, and I'm going to sell one of them because I don't need them both. I was just trying both of them to see you know, what I what I liked. And what I like about the 12 PSI one is I can get in and get out of it by myself. The 15 PSI, which was twice as expensive, I, it, my wife has to put me in all the time. So, And since then, like I said, I've been doing the Libo 2 more than anything. But what I'll do is you sprint 20 seconds, you hit the you hit the 90% oxygen, and you keep sprinting. 
Well, now that oxygen is rushing into your body and it's helped healing you, I believe, because I know how my brain is. You know, you walk into a room and you go, what the fuck did I walk in here for? And, and you just normally you just walk out. I did that for years. I don't do that anymore. If I walk into a room and I forget, okay, why are you here? And I'll think about it. And about 50% of the time, I'll remember now. Uh -huh. before I just just gave up. I don't do, you have to test your brain all the time. So I, the, the protocol for this is to do the 20 second sprint with epoxia, 10 per second sprint with the 90% oxygen, coast for 30 and come back to it and do 20, 10, coast, 20, 10, five sets. And then you go to pure oxygen. Now what I changed it to, because I'm conditioned at a different level right now, I'm doing, after 10, 10 minutes of 8% oxygen, I will go into a 30-second sprint. And man, I, I'm, in the beginning, I'm breathing out my nose. By that time, now I'm breathing out my mouth. And then I'll do a 15-second sprint on the 90% oxygen. And then I don't turn it down. I stand up and I just nice and slowly just go for another 15 seconds. And then I flip it down in the 8% and I'll do it again for 30 seconds and 15 seconds. And then I got to turn it down. So it's easy to go. And then I'll do 25, 15, 25, 15, 25, 15. And the last five sets will be 20, 10. And then what's the hardest thing? This is part of DDP's gauntlet, which you're about to see out there. And I would love you to come out and do this with me again, where I'll interview you but we'll, we'll do this work, this, this gauntlet. You do the ice bath, then you get on the bike. And the hardest thing on the bike is now that you've got through that and you're breathing just 90% oxygen, now we're going to do that. I can't remember the guy, the ice guy, where you breathe in, deep breath, and you're breathing, taking that deep breath in and pushing all that air out 30 times. Then we're going to take that deep breath Breathe all the air out and now keep pedaling. I've got some guys who go five seconds, but then <laughs> they, go, they can go 10 seconds and then 12 seconds. I do five sets of that. The other day I did 47 seconds with no air. Now there's no, there's no pressure on the bike. It's literally just, but my legs are moving Yeah, and push all the air out and then you got to breathe. You got you to breathe all that air. And then when we get off of the bike of doing the epoxy training, then we're going to get on the mat, do 10-minute warm-up of DDPY. And my newest thing, Dan, which I really want to turn you on to, uh, and I'll hook you up with it, but I want you to do it. I'd love you to come and do it with me first. They're called... Okay, don't mind me asking. Let me know. Where, where is actually, where is home now? Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, okay. But I'm building a beautiful retreat on Panama City Beach on the beach. And that's going to be killer. That'll probably, that'll happen probably, I'll probably get that done around the beginning of next summer. But let me finish this, the gauntlet. So what you're going to do next, have you ever heard of BFR, blood flow restriction training? You ever heard of that? No, but something that's similar to, I'll, I'll, go, go ahead, keep going. I, there's some more things. The heavy load. Lifters, they would wrap their legs with it. They would wrap, wrap, wrap their arms. And they weren't safe wraps. I developed with a guy from a company called Rock Cups, the Power Cups. And there's no one who has a blood flow restriction like it. And what it is, is you're, you're taking the cuff and you put it on the, as high up as it'll go on your arm. And it's two inches. And there's ones that are like blood pressure cup things okay. that pump them up, they get tighter. Ours yeah. is not a tourniquet, but a tourniquet style where you turn the power cup and you power up. And now think of your, your heart, okay? And the arteries that come out of your heart and go all the way down your fingers and down your legs. Yeah. And for all the oxygen of the blood from the pumping of your heart, oxidizing the blood and coming into your hands and then it's your veins that it returns on. So think of your arteries as PVC piping. Mm -hmm. So the blood free flows into your arms, right? 
Think of the veins that come back. Think of them as a garden hose. And if you step on a garden hose, the water's still going to come out, but it's going to trickle, right? Yeah, you're going to kink it. Yeah, yeah you, you, you infringe upon it, yes. Exactly. So this is what really, like, when I first started doing this, it was Tommaso Ciampa from the WWE. And he had these ones that blew up like a blood pressure cup. But it wasn't really... There were two, there was too many things to do. Like you had to clip the thing on and pump it up. Then you had to pop it and then you pop it back up again. Mine are just literally, you turn them. They're comfortable as hell. They're easy to get on. We're actually launching them at the Olympia, which is coming up in uh, Orlando in November. And that's what we've done a soft launch right now at powercups.com. And here's what it's done for me. First of all, they were, de they were developed for rehabilitation. It was a Japanese doctor who developed these. All they've really been used for for the last 60 years is you, you, you tore your ACL, you tore your meniscus, you put it around your leg, you, you know, in, increase the pressure. In, the, in our scenario, it would be dot power up and, and create the, uh, the uh, pressure at the top of the leg that the same thing happens. The blood flow comes in and it trickles out. Just walking, if you tell your ACL, when you can start to walk, just walking the science, it's not me, it's the science that's behind this is off the charts for healing faster. You tear your rotator cuff, you put them on your arms, you do your exercises. In the beginning, you know, you've torn muscles before, you can't do shit, you can't lift your arm up or nothing, so you gotta pull it up, pull it down, pull it up, until you can walk it up the wall, when you're wearing these cups, you're going to heal faster because it's pushing all the blood there. Now, no one has ever turned this into a workout like around the, the cups until me. And I'll tell you why. If we're, you know, me and you have lifted plenty of weight in our day. So when you get on, the, let's say the bench press and you're going to do bench. Well, if you're wearing the cups, you can't go from flat bench to incline bench to dumbbells because after the first serious set that you're doing you're blown and what i mean by that when you're using power cups you're going to do 30 reps but you're going to use 25 to 35 percent of what might be your maximum yeah, load man, okay so when I, I didn't lift for 15 years bro because every time i left the gym the ego that you know walks into the gym. Oh God, what did I do to my shoulder? Oh God, what did I do to my pec? What did I do to my back? I never left there feeling good. I left there feeling defeated and it was blowing me away. So that's when I went to DDP yoga only and doing dynamic resistance with no weight, no cuffs. So when I originally used these power cups that we have today, when I originally, I was using it with no weight. So you know that dynamic resistance, uh, I think uh, Dave Mel Meltzer, Mel Meltzer was the, the weight lifter who came up with dynamic tension. Yeah, yeah, like, they, they, Dave, uh, yeah, you said um, Metzger, Met like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we, we know, same guy, right? So I took those principles and put them into a lunge, into a warrior, and we might be doing back, we might be doing chest, we might be doing buys, we might be doing tries. Now you can put the cups on and get an even more intense workout. And every time you flex or engage a muscle, your heart has to beat faster to get the blood to the muscle. So it becomes a really kick-ass cardiovascular workout. But when you're lifting weights, and I'm 67 now, since I've been doing this serious with weights for the last nine months, bro, I put an inch on this arm and it's hard as a rock. Like it's, it's, it's the same pump with less weight that you got when you were younger. Like I had to start with 10 pounds. That's what I started with. Today on curls, supinated curls, I can do 20 pounds. I don't believe I'm ever gonna go over that because when you do 30 reps, take off <laughs> seconds, come back with 15 reps, take off 30 seconds, 15 reps, come back 30 seconds, 15 reps, your buys are shot. So. Yeah. 
go over and do triceps. And we'll do the same thing. 30, 15, 15, 15. And then we'll go to a new exercise for buys, whether it's preacher curls or it's tricep you know, uh, nose crunchers, whatever it is. I'm telling you, bro, I'm about to change the face of fitness because especially anybody who's 50 and up, because kids want to still lift ridiculous weight because they can. And Cody Rhodes, who uses my stuff, tore his pec. I don't know if you ever saw that match he had last year where he tore his pec and he still wrestled. He had to have it completely reattached. He was freaking doing 315 for multiple reps and boom, he will never lift heavy again. He uses my cups. He looks phenomenal. Lifting 25 to 30% of the maximum load. So that's my new thing. And then, of course, we hit the mat again for some DDPY, and then we do an interview. So I would love you to come out to my place. Stay with me. And no, I, I definitely, you know, when, when, uh, when we get down to we'll, we'll, we'll chat about a few things, because I'm, I'm really big about well, I think anyone that, that hits over 50 years of age, when, when the, I'll say that ARP was right there with that birthday card. Happy birthday, senior <laughs> citizen. It's the birthday card that no one wants to ever receive. It's like a backhanded compliment right there. But uh, it's uh, but the thing is, you got to realize how many people have come and gone in, in the industry of professional wrestling alone. We look at that one the industry is probably has the highest death rate of any profession that I'm aware of. Yeah, a lot, sure. lot of it's due to chemical cocktails, but you know, that's sure. that, that that is what it is. But but uh it's uh it, it, it's it, but if anyone was ever gonna go into business, I would tell them take professional wrestling 101 and 102 because it will prepare you for the absolute worst in human beings. <laughs> And you, 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 nothing should surprise you after that fact. Yeah, man, it, it was the highest highs and at times the lowest lows. But that's part of what the business is, you know. The it just it was it was a great ride. I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed any of it. But if if I didn't do it, I would never have the success that I've had after with professional wrestling that I've had with DDP yoga and now our I don't know what again I, I apologize for interrupting you but you see what 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 just having this conversation refreshed of course here with you right now you have a mindset right now and a lot of people don't understand that mindset and when you become when a person becomes determined to set a goal and most people most people they do wishful thinking they wish they could do this they wish they could do that because right. we all had our friends in high school that were all going to say, I'm going to go off and I'm going to do this. I'm going to go off and do that. You had your friends in college that were going to do this, do that, and, or in life. And that's what I tell people. I go, I never told anyone really too much about what I was going to do because it didn't matter to anybody else except for me. But when my buddies in high school would say, hey, Dad, let's go out and get shit face here uh, tonight. I go, can't. I got a football game tomorrow night. I've got a wrestling match the following day. I got to make weight. I can't be underneath the influence of alcohol or stuff like this. So I, I always had my, my scapegoat type of uh, type of things. So again, that's where it, it, it was easy for me. But then they're they're back in contact with me today, forty some years on later, and and they, they realize, wow, you really you stuck to your guns and you stuck to you stuck to your values. I go. I again with some things that you don't know about me. I have seven other brothers and sisters. I'm second on the totem pole. Yeah. Did ask a mom or dad for money to go to college ever into Dan Severs mind? No, because mom and dad don't have money for, for me to go to college. They're feeding and clothing eight kids. So it's kind of right. like, how do I do it on my own? I'm not looking for the handout. I'm looking to know how I'm going to do it. And, and the sport of athletics is what led me to go to Arizona State on a full athletic scholarship for sport of wrestling. But it, it's, it's one of those tough sports to get into. I mean, the only reason I ever got involved in professional wrestling was because of a new ruling that came down from the United States Olympic Committee as of uh, 1992. A new ruling came down. The athletes could be both amateur and professional simultaneously. At that point, I, I'd been approached on the independent scene, but I never turned pro before then. 92, ran with it because opportunity presented itself. Why not? In t today's age, a collegiate athlete, as of as of this year, 
They are now professional athletes. They can they can go from one college to the next, and and there and there's no there's no penalty. You could be you know <laughs> playing football for for one major program, and also this other program says they actually are offering you. Here you go, Diamond Dust Cash. We, we got a Rolls Royce here for you, hundred thousand dollars. I mean, literally, you can go to the highest bidder now, and there is no you don't have to sit out for a year because you transferred nothing like that. So I still think that there should be some kind of a penalty of sitting out that one year so that you, you just can't keep going to the highest bidder because only the programs with the most money will survive. And yeah, I, but you know, gotta look at the, these kids today, no matter what, as far as I've mixed emotions about that because these colleges make all the fucking money. Well, you know, and I mean, if you look at some of the players that have really, and I just watched a documentary on um, Johnny football and that program at A&M made hundreds of millions of dollars off that kid because he created it all because without them, they didn't have the program. And when he came in there, when you watch that documentary and you think, well, he did get the sign and he did get a big payoff, but that only, you know, if you're living that lifestyle, that only lasts so long because, you know, he had a lot of issues out of it. And it was really interesting to watch, but a lot of these kids in college, you know, they're one injury away from not getting the deal of your yes. pro. So they're, 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 they're one injury away, but then also they don't have the, knowledge background to know how to save how to invest how to the, the, how to have a more diverse yep. portfolio so that you can survive in good markets bad markets knowing that yeah the portfolio is going to go down but do you need to touch any of this no you should be good because you got these other things that are working for you have you ever heard of a the machine is called an eecp machine it's it's it's, it's used in cardiology this is something that, gosh, I've been working with for probably over 30 years now uh, as part of my career. Part of my training camp was I would go into, I would go on to an EE, it, the initials are EECP, mm-hmm. and each word, and each letter stands for like a five yeah. or six syllable yeah. word, uh, word. Hey. but but basically it's, it's, for, it's for blood, it's for, for blood flow. So I would go on this and, and, and literally I, there'd be like three sets of pressure cuffs, one on your, your calves thighs and your lower abdominal region and then there would be a heart monitor and so that when your heart pumps out these cuffs would all be in a rest mode but but when when your heart goes in, in relaxed mode then that's when the cuffs would go in sequence squish 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 and literally it would force the blood right back up and through so what what it has a history and a proven uh, i should say proven track record history of as one gets older your blood vessels like that start to narrow Black right. and stuff like that starts to build up on the arterial walls. Well, this machine, right. it, it, it's called like a shear, almost like a wash machine. It goes back and forth and it literally clears off black and that, but then also will dilate your vessels back up to normal size, uh, up to the point that it will even, they have certain things that they already have a record where it has bypassed entire 100% blockage. It will actually help grow a new arterial wall around blockage. So I, I definitely want to talk with you some more even after this interview is done because there's a lot of things that I'm still doing in the health and wellness that I think you and I could be doing some collaborations on to where getting that body and that mind all back together here. Because the reality is you're you're at 67 now. I'm at 65. Yeah. You know, you gotta look at you gotta look at the demographics. First off, anyone that's over 50 years of age, they're closer to death than they are to life. Sure. That's that's it. That's just the reality of it. And uh, life doesn't keep getting better for them. It slowly starts going down the twos because most Americans are live a very sedentary lifestyle. Sure. And the inevitability, I, I forget what, what the stats were, that uh, I think that something like sixty-seven percent or higher that after they take some sort of a fall, that is the the beginning of the end Dude. for them. That they that they're like eighteen months later they're gone. I I I literally noticed it probably about two years ago, and they give you the thing to fill out when you go to your doctor. And the number one question was, "When was the last time you fell?" And I thought, "Well, when was the last time I worked?" 
you know, I take a diamond cutter. You know, I just feel dumb. <laughs> like if I fall, I'm getting paid to fall. <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, there are times, and I, I got to give my program the credit where I will never forget. I was on. I was about sixty three at the time. And I was going down the stairs. I had you know stuff in front of me, and uh -huh. I thought at last stair, and I wasn't. And now I'm hitting air. And like any other 63-year-old dude, he broke his hip right there. He tore his ACL, whatever. I still kept it. I, I mean, I, I strained my back. I strained my knee. But I didn't tear anything because of the work that I do every day. And obviously, me and you, we aren't sedentary. You know, because, you know, once you stop, you stop everything gets compiled up and yeah. so i i don't ever stop moving period uh but i really want to know about that eeoc i'm going to yeah. text you when we get done with this so you can send me make sure i got the right letters yeah no, again I'll, I'll make sure that i get to your correct email I, i'm a whole lot better emailer because i can type more things and i can attach more things texting yeah. i'm good about just simply saying call me <laughs> i i still suck it in, in the, the, the the phone realm right there but no there's there's a lot of things that I definitely would like to collaborate on you because there's just there's a lot of people they just don't know or they 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 buy into that the easy programs you know they, they're, they're, there's all kinds of really easy programs that that people will try to put you into that will they really return the results there for you no and the reality is like I said before just that sets a balance that's what I mean just watching you know just before getting on there there I, I forget the the gentleman's name there uh, that uh, Tony who who just sent me the the, the Oh, the Arthur. Information. The Arthur Arthur video. Yeah, or, Arthur. I mean, Arthur. again, there's a, a. I guess when when you helped out Arthur, and again, I don't I don't remember what Arthur's last name was, but but you helped Arthur, who was a a former uh, vet, and uh, he had gained a great deal of, of weight and stuff like that. But but you took him from from someone that would, in, in today's world would have been suicidal, sure. you know, and and then to give him back and give him life. I mean, I, I look at. All the things that you were doing, you already incorporated with with, with your DDP program. You with all the the yoga and stance stuff like that that you're putting them through. That you have a sense of balance already that you're incorporating, which is good because I said for seniors, I was gonna I was gonna so as a mockery, only as a joke, but actually as, as, from a shoot perspective, come to with it, I was gonna be doing bingo with the beast, but <laughs> but it was gonna be. You know, and the next letter is B4, but before we go on to the next, uh, you know, thing, I want right. you to be able to stand up from your chair. Sure. And, 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 and without grabbing the table, without pushing off anything, because if you're able to stand up from your chair, that's called a squat. Sure. Now repeat that nine more times. You just did 10 squats because most people, they got to push off the armrest. They got to pull on the thing. And as you get older, you start losing more and more of your sense of balance. So there, it, there's, there's little things that you can do that really don't don't mean you have to go to the gym. A lot of people are like, well, I can't afford the gym membership. What did that floor cost you? That floor cost you nothing, but you still have to gather up the effort to get off your butt, get over on the floor, and to do some sit-ups, some push-ups, some stretching, some yoga. You got to put forth the effort. And if you yep. don't, if, if if people don't want to do it, then don't don't bitch and piss about uh, not having quality of life because that's how I look at it. It's just like anything else that you want to do here, business wise, stuff like that. If you don't put forth the effort, how, how's that? How's your goal ever going to be uh, achieved? Also, so again, not, I'm, I'm 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 really big in the health health and wellness industry right now. Again, just because of the age factors, but I see such a need, and when it comes just to what you do for those hyperbaric chambers. Um, I have a gentleman right in Scottsdale, Arizona, that I get these hyperbreak chambers from. He's got he's got a couple of these EECP machines, and then we're actually just looking at for location just to set up. But then there's also another thing that's, that is known as a, a a lamb chair, a chair because most men and women, at, again, 50 years above, they start having problems with uh, uh, with their bladder and stuff like that, especially women that have had children. Sure, and so. Now I've got a, got a machine that you can just sit on for 30 minutes and that gives you, I don't know, I think it's like 12,000 or 15,000 Kegel exercises. 
because most women most women don't know how to even do a kegel. Most sure. men most men can't even fathom that either. But uh, yeah. it's, but it's the same thing. But but it helps. You know, it helps with bladder issues for for women. Still helps with bladder issues for men, and and other stuff. Because uh, I always tell people, if you don't believe me, about the need or the uh, not the need, but uh, some of the uh, uh, comical ways that God, God has a comical sense of humor. All you gotta do is go to Costco, and you'll see one entire aisle that is dedicated to adult diapers. Right, crazy. Yes. Crazy. <laughs> Again, this this is all the reason why I'm just doing my best to hold back the hands of time, Danny. That's all yeah. I'm doing. You know? Well, that's that's all that's all any of us can do right there. Just try to do the best we can. But again, you you do a lot of good things. You you you. I I remember because I I had uh, Jake the Snake Roberts out there, and I mean he just sung your praises left and right because you took a man there that uh, was knocking on death's doorstep. Sure. And you brought brought him back, and you gave him life. You gave him purpose. I mean, it, it's uh, you've done that for, for a number of different people. So when Tony said that he, he got a hold of you and, and you wanted to come out, I think, man, this is this is great because you know it just. I mean, people like like you are are my heroes. These these are are, are my kind of heroes because not too many people want to put forth the effort. And the fact that not only uh, not only do you talk about it, you live it. You did it for yourself, right? Because and everyone. I'm the first, you know, test dummy for everything. Right now, we we shot a show last year, and it was a, a docu series. So think of Jake's movie if it was a you know, episodic as opposed to one movie, uh, one documentary. And Butterbean came in, and Bean was in a wheelchair for probably three years, and when he would walk around, his back was like. I just, I didn't, I didn't understand. He, when he wrote, when he came into my house with the crutches and bent over walking, I was like, oh my God, like, how are we going to help him? And my business partner, Steve, you, uh, he looks at me, he goes, but what if we can? And we did. Uh, Cause Bean's doing <laughs> great. He's doing great. And he's actually training and he's staying at my the same place where we filmed the Resurrection of Jake Snake. He's staying right now, and I'll train with him a couple times a week. My my one of my other guys, Josh, trains with him all the rest of the time, and he's doing everything from hitting the bag to doing all his boxing to the running to DDP yoga every morning. Hour of DDP yoga. He'll get another half hour later on because you know he's got two new hips now. He can move now, and we're you know so far he's looking really good. Like he, I think he may have one more fight at fifty-seven just yeah. to go there and see where he started to where he's going. Uh, the the docu series will come up on probably Amazon Prime at the beginning of the year. We're editing it all right now, and him and. Buff Bagwell, who went through a serious transformation himself because he was an addict, and we got him to realize you're an addict, bro, and get him off the shit. And his everything for his life is completely different as well. Uh, but again, all the shit that we teach people is shit that <laughs> I taught myself to take care of me, except for the addiction. I was lucky, my father was an addict. Um, and I was in the nightclub business for, for decade plus and running nightclubs and just, you know, I was a guy who did, I drink, a, you know, I drank a good amount, but I never went past, I won't say never, but after 35, I never went past that level of inebriation. I could take myself and go, okay, I'm done. When, when I'm you like, see your father was an addict, you'd be, it, 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 it'd be for alcohol. Is that yeah. what you mean? Okay, all right. I just, I just, yeah. just want to make me, clarification on that. So, no. Yeah, I stopped doing all drugs by the time I was 29, except for alcohol, which is, of course, a drug as well. But, you know, I like <laughs> Scott and Jake used to say that I was an amateur, you know, <laughs> and they were the real alcoholics. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, you know, now, you know, over this last, you know, 10 years, I'll drink once a week, but it's not a lot. You know, uh, right. the blue moon, I might catch a really good buzz, but that's it. Uh, it's that something that I don't want to feel like shit the next day. You know, exactly. I don't, you know, it's not worth it to me. Yeah, and yeah. I, it's all about 
life, it doesn't matter how old you get. I have friends of mine who are 89 years old and doing my program for the last 20 plus years. And like, I talk to them all the time and it's like, Ted says that it doesn't matter how old you get, it's quality of life. So yes. that's why I do all the shit that I do for me. I'm and I'm trying to share with people, but you know, most people they don't invest that uh, time. Some people will listen, some um, a lot of people won't. Right. Uh, usually until they are faced with uh right. a, a mortality. Right. When, You're right. when, when, when that doc says, okay, if you keep on the same path right now, I give you five more years. I give you 10 more years because you're killing yourself because of this, this, or this. And uh, I mean, it, it, anything from, could be drugs, could be alcohol. Food is an addiction as well. I mean, there's lots of people that, that uh, especially in the last couple of years of just COVID, people were not going to gyms. People are depressed. People are, are really not interacting with each other. And and they're just sitting around. So it, it's you know you, you, there's a lot more people with issues today than there was four years ago. That's for sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, you said of food, Dan. You're just saying food. Like here in America, overindulgence is a huge thing. Like you know, I mean, well, 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 see now, now, uh, DDP now. See Tony knows. I like to terrorize the buffet every now and then. <laughs> Well, that, there's no. nothing wrong. See, there's nothing wrong with eating what you want, but you need to do it in in a proper way. Like fasting is a huge thing. Like I believe, yeah. you know, I mean, you don't, it's, you shouldn't have to no, fine yeah, with it. You, no, can, I, I, you can have I whatever do. you want. I believe it doesn't have to. I mean, you got to find out what works best for you as well, because everybody's different. Everyone's body type, you know, what's going to affect me is going to affect you different, and then affect you know DDP differently. You know, so we all got to figure out what works best for you. Yeah. I, I, like I eat super clean, and it's the only main reason is because if I eat the regular shit, I I will feel like shit. So, you know, there's nothing worth. It's not worth it to me. There's nothing I could eat that would make me want to go through discomfort and pain. Nothing, you know. So, again, that's a decision. What's okay for in in a, a day in the life of for DDP? Do you have? Do you do three meals? Or let me ask you for a question. Do you do three meals a day, or what? Uh, what would you? What what's your like an eating cycle there for you? Not anymore. You know, I've been doing the intermittent fasting. You know, so I'll eat probably in my window is probably the eight hours. You know, when I will, and it's mainly I'll drink shakes. My my wife makes. You know, first of all, we use you know plant based protein, organic. I won't eat any of that shit if it ain't organic. I don't want the shit with the pesticides yeah. spray. Uh, the only time I'll eat any of that shit is when I'm on the road and I got to eat something. Um, but I'll get up. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and get in that cold plunge. And then I hit the epoxy bike Then I get on the mat and three days a week, I lift, I do the power cuffs and the other three days a week that where I'm going to be not on the road, I'll do, just ddpy and i'll do it hardcore for like an hour hour and 15 minutes and it's a lot of really strong conditioning but also stretching and strengthening the muscles ligaments and tendons to break up the scar tissue like one of the things that i was told by my doctor who is the hawks and the falcons and uh the braves doctor dr x he's taken he's done my ddp yoga before and I went to see him. I said, is there anything I can do for this left knee? And he's like, honestly, nothing. Like, you've had everything done to it. And the bottom line is, is that there's really nothing more that you can do to, to help it. So uh, what I did, and it's a series of stretches that I was trying to get where I could bend my knee more and put my heel on my glute and I was like this far like probably 10 inches from it now I'm like a quarter of an inch from it but it took me three months of figuring it out and when I first started that it was so the, the, I'm bone on bone so it was so uncomfortable that I'm willing to go not to pain but I'm willing to go to discomfort 
to help to heal. And if you would have told me when I started it that I could do what I do right now, I would say you're crazy. Plus, no more pain in my left knee. Like these are a series of things that I've been doing really much for the last 25 years of ways to alleviate pain by breaking up scar tissue and cre creating mobility. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so far, so good. You know, uh, my goal is not to have any replacements, knee replacements, hip sure. replacements. The shoulders are so shot, but I still have that incredible mobility and I have the strength enough. Because remember, when I'm lifting, I'm lifting lightweight, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. When I'm doing chest, I'm up to 40. But 40 pounds, that's nothing compared to what I used to lift. But I'm also doing 30 reps and then 15, 15, 15. And so I have the strength now. And I finally got that uh that secret that that we only get from weightlifting like that hard physical muscle but my mobility is that it's at, at an all-time high right now and i'm just trying to keep it so now yeah. now we're everything trying to keep it that i mean the, the lifting pad that you should you're, you're speak about really is, is is basically like what a bodybuilder would be doing lighter weight higher repetition you're going to get a phenomenal pump in, in the process right there. You're still going to do your, did the body good as long as you keep doing range of motion with, with your arms and legs and things of that nature. So no, I, I think whatever you got going on right now is, is fantastic. But, I mean, but even talking about the gym industry, look at how machinery has changed over the decades. What used, yeah. to, what used to be just the free weights and a lifting platform, and now they got all these different machines that you can do all kinds of really unique things on. It's uh, it's really, it's really pretty interesting just to, to see how that has has changed. I mean, that, most of the time I have uh, in my my property in uh, Coldwater, Michigan, I've got wrestling mats that are just laid out on the mat. I just like to be like going out there and just flopping out on the mats and just stretching and rolling around and uh, just. That's that's my that's my world that I enjoy just just uh, get the body just loosened up. No, hundred percent. Listen, guys, I got to go because I got a speaking gig that I got to get okay. to. Look, before you run, promote any of your social media. Uh, if people want to get in contact with you, uh, pick up any of your products. But just, I'll tell you, the main thing is, if you want to try DDP yoga, it's always seven days free. If you're military. It's always, and anybody who's the first responder, cops, firemen, uh, uh, military, uh, it's always half price, always at DDP Yoga. Just go to ddpyoga.com. But if you're going to get any of it, the our app is off the charts. And now I'm adding in our power cuff workouts onto the DDP Yoga Now app as well. If you want to learn more about power cuffs, all the science is there. Go to power cuffs with an S dot com and it's all there danny i'm gonna e email me all right because yep. I, I yeah i'm pretty sure you have it or yep. tony well, as soon as we when you close it out i'll step, tell you what it is uh the bottom line is email me and let's get a time where you can come out if you're coming through atlanta you stay with me it's only need like 24 hours you come in we work out we go through the, the, the gauntlet and then uh and then you you go off and you know next day leave and we'll do an interview as well and what you thought of it and what we're doing uh it's really it's it's all stuff that we're like-minded and we want to be able to hold back the hands of time as long as we can so yeah. brother appreciate you having me on and uh, uh have an awesome day all right take care we'll see you Thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. You better like, subscribe, and share, or I'm going to come to your house.